be present, listen to what's going on. If it makes sense, move it along, but also put it in a priority list to go forward and then eventually execute upon it. I think, you know, right now it's a little bit haphazard. I think we just like poke here and here and here. We need to make sure that we set plans and then work those plans in order to get success. Without supplies, there's no surgery. Without products, there's no patient care. Welcome to Power Supply, the healthcare supply chain podcast focused on helping you navigate the intricacies of logistics, purchasing, contracting, and supplier relationships. Each episode, we speak with healthcare executives, supply chain leaders, and innovative entrepreneurs from across the country as they share their stories, experience, and expertise on the industry we love. From the loading dock to strategic sourcing, from buyers to the C-suite, and across the enterprise, we tackle the real-life issues impacting the healthcare supply chain. Whether you're tuning in for conversation or inspiration, we're glad you're here. You're just in time to hear it from the source and stock up on insight. So sit back and plug into Power Supply. Today, we are speaking with Jim McManus, principal at JPM3 Financial and Advisory Services. And in a way, Hayes, this episode is piggybacking off of a conversation that we had with Martin Lewis and really talking about adoption of new technologies and, you know, from the manufacturer's perspective and and a marketing sort of position. But today, we're going to be speaking with Jim McManus about adoption of new technology, a lot more from the healthcare side and talking about why supply chain has really been elevated and what's important to CFOs. Jim has uh, been a CFO. We're going to get his background in just a little bit. And I know, Hayes, you've known Jim for quite a while as well. I've known Jim for probably 15, 16 years, and he is an outstanding executive. And to your point, he literally started his career on the consulting side, but he was a supply chain executive for many years out uh, west. And now he's a CFO and he's moved his way up. So he has great insight. He's been there. He's done that. Come on, listen on to us because you're really going to enjoy it. All right. We're going to be right back with Jim. Stay with us. I'm Hayes Walder. This is Gary Skinner. And I'm Justin Poulin. A production of 17 Studios. You're listening to Power Supply. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Jim McManus, principal at JPM3 Financial and Advisory Services. And we're going to be talking about adoption of new technologies in healthcare and why the process for new technology adoption is so inefficient. This is piggybacking off of a recent conversation we had with Martin Lewis to some extent as well. So I'm sure we'll be drawing some parallels there. Jim, thanks so much for coming on the Power Supply podcast with us today. Well, thank you very much, Justin, for, for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Jim, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background? I know you have a, a broad background in operations and finance and healthcare supply chain, and I'm sure that there's going to be several of our audience listeners that are familiar with you as well. Well, I started a very, very long time ago, so I know I don't look my age, but back in, in the in the 80s is when I came out of college and started my first career uh, with a CPA firm, regional CPA firm in Southern California. And that was a great experience because I got to travel all over the place, which was fun. I got to get a good flavor of what was going on in the country. And as my time progressed with the, uh, with the CPA firm, we got involved with this thing called DRG based setting for hospitals. And so I got involved in a large engagement there and I, I really actually enjoyed it to the point where I ended up going over to the intermediary, which is also known for most people as the dark side. Because the intention really of the intermediary was to really take money away from the hospitals and give them lower rates for setting their, you know, their DRGs, their base rate for inpatient services and the like. So after doing that for a couple of years, I realized I was on the dark side and I was uh, recruited away into a regional uh, healthcare organization still based in Southern California. 
It had a very significant hospital, but then all these other companies around it. I was in the corporate office, worked my way up to corporate controller and was there for a period of time. And then I moved actually into my first role as a, as a CFO within American Medical International, which eventually became Tenet when they came together with National Medical Enterprises. So it's, it's AMI, NME, and here we go with Tenet. So I was there for a period of seven years, and then I was actually in a couple, various couple hospitals in the CFO role, was also in a regional position advocating for financial policy and that with, with the organization. And then moved from there into the nonprofit world of the St. Joseph Health System, which was based in Southern California, had, had hospitals, Northern California, Southern California, West Texas, Eastern New Mexico. And there I was originally in a hospital as a CFO, ended up in the health system office as their vice president of finance, was there for about 17 years. But during that time, I had the opportunity to do a couple different things. First, work in operations in some areas, but also to begin their supply chain function. At the time, it was still called materials management, but we developed the, the St. Joseph Health supply chain. We were the, one of the first organizations to be with MedAssets. Well, I'm just going to ask you about that. What was really the big mover for going from materials management to now what is supply chain? I mean, being one of the earlier organizations to do that, what kind of got you all headed in that direction? Well, I mean, when you think of materials, you think of stuff, right? You know, and it's okay. You got a product. You've got, you got, here's, here's a orthopedic implant. Here's, here's a, you know, four by four, you know, or two by two, whatever you use, you know. But actually, when you look at supply chain, you're looking at truly elongated process. You know, it really takes more into account. Really, you're looking at, first of all, how you contract and and, and get something in writing to where you're going to get pricing. How does that come in your house? And how do you how you get it in through the distributor? Then how you distribute it out throughout your house? And then it also takes into the, the play an area that we really don't talk a whole lot about today, which we should which is utilization. So there's really two components of the supply chain here. There, there's the, really the price of the product, but then how you use that product. And, and so that really goes in as well. And then the back end is, you know, how are you going to pay for this stuff? And you have a procure to pay system. You know, how, you know, do you match everything appropriately? With, it's like a four-way match. Everything's got to match on price before you pay. And it's all about streamlining, making a fluid process to where you can supply your organization or your health system with products, clinically efficacious products at a reasonable price and, and go from there. So that's what we were all about when we were at uh, St. Joseph doing that. And we had a great assistance from Med Assets. They were just getting started at the time. So we were actually their first major system that, that we had there. So did that for you know a pretty long period of time. And then I said, gee, I want to go back in the CFO world. This was like, you know, somewhere down the road. So I decided I'm going to pick up from Southern California where I spent my life, go to Northern California and was actually a system CFO for the Marin Healthcare District up there for about five years. Had a great time, did bond issuances, worked with the medical group. First time actually in a district hospital, which was kind of a district organization, which is a whole different way of governing, which was nice. And then from there, went up to Multicare in the Pacific Northwest for some time, and it was our system CFO there as well. And now, why you call me JPM3 Financial Advisory Services, nothing you know specific about JPM3, James Patrick McManus III. That's just my name. That's what everybody does. But uh, I, I do some you know, advisory work, but I'm also doing a, 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 a really, I'm, I'm also a permanent fixture here in South Central Ohio, Chillicothe, with the, uh, the Adena Healthcare System, which is an incredible system, you know, a major regional hospital in a rural environment surrounded by critical access hospitals, urgent cares, and clinics, which is a fantastic way of looking at, you know, how you deliver care and develop access in the community. So I think, Justin, what I've been very appreciative in my career, which has been a longstanding career now, is the opportunity to go from for-profit, non-profit, large system, small system, standalone. It's a great way to get educated on the various aspects of healthcare. And so I've been very uh, fortunate there. You know, as a CFO, how do you view supply chain? Like it's critical function. I mean, everything that we do in the hospital is about healing patients, right? So how do you, from, you know, even a financial perspective, but also from the vision of the organization being at the C-level, 
how do you view supply chain? For those especially that are just coming up and maybe don't have as much exposure or as we're seeing supply chain getting connected and, and more of an audience at the sea level over the last several years, like I think it would be helpful for some people to just hear you know, what the perspective of the CFO is related to supply chain. It's a real interesting question, Justin, because as a CFO, you tend to be more focused on the revenue stream. At least I've been, my conversations with CFOs, it's all about the accounts receivable, the AR, you know, billing and getting paid for everything you can. And then other strategies uh, around the balance sheet, you know, the, the funding, the debt, all of that. And, and when you look at, and I, I did this myself, my, my first CFO position, yeah, I, I heard supply, I heard materials management. I said, yeah, just get the stuff, get it up on the floors <laughs> on time. We're good to go. And that was about the end of it. You know, I didn't really know much about, we talk about GPO. What is GPO? You know, and I had to get explained that that's a group purchasing organization. And, and that's kind of how it works, Jim, and all that. I said, okay, we'll just get it done. That type of thing. Pricing wasn't an issue. Just we'll pay the price and get the stuff in. After I really, came to St. Joseph and was working with the supply chain and developing that, I really had a different appreciation for its impact on healthcare. And that's where I think more CFOs have now experienced that and they see it as an integral part of management within their hospital or health system organization. So it's now the both and because you have to make sure you do get paid for everything that you bill for, but you need to really also be cost conscious in both ways. We talked about the price of the product and how it comes in, but also how you utilize it. And a good CFO today, from in my opinion, is that they kind of force themselves a little bit more into the operational space to have that conversation on utilization. So I think we're <laughs> evolving as a CFO community to really understand and appreciate more of the efforts of supply chain. And last point, Justin, in this is that it really became to the highest level when we hit March of 2020, when all of a sudden, oh, we can't get supplies, we can't get protective equipment. That's when supply chain took front and center stage. And, and that's where I think everybody's eyes were open then is, okay, this is a very important part of our organization. Do you think it, you'll that supply chain will maintain that audience with the sea level as this sort of calms down? Or do you think this is situational? No, I think it's going to maintain the level. Because right now, hospitals and health systems, and I, I, I kind of thought about this a while, you know, we're all kind of sick right now, right? We're, we're all losing a fair amount of, there are very few are actually making an operating margin and cash flow. Some are bifurcated, some make operating margin and, you know, some do both. Some don't make an operating margin and have cash flow, but we have to get healed. You know, we have to be able to, fix what we have because so many organizations are just losing money every month. You know, admissions are down, outpatient services are down, contracting for the payers is, is challenging, getting paid appropriately is challenging. You know, supply chain is a way of kind of starting the healing process because with the urgency out there right now, everybody can come together and say, what can we do around supply chain to have the products at reasonable prices and use them correctly? And so it doesn't result in having to, you know, restructure your organization or your workforce. You know, you, this is something that everything you do can go directly to the bottom line. So to me, I think it's going to sustain and have a higher level of relevance in, in the future. Jim, let me just jump in and change it a little bit. I think any organization that you go into, the supply chain exec, whoever's in that role is fortunate to have you there because clearly your background, you've been there, you've done that. So you understand those challenges of everything from exceptions to you name it, backwards, all that good stuff. But my question, it relates to, uh, let's just say a, a company out there is listening to us right now and they have a great product, you know, it's revolutionary. It's all those awesome things, right? They all say it's going to save you this and that. But clinically, it's great. Operationally, it's great. But now the question, the financial piece. And let's just say they hypothetically say, you know what, if you use this correctly and it's done all, you know, according to plan, we're going to save a day, a, you know, a day stay in the hospital. How does that, does that type of 
statement bubble up to you there or somebody in your department somebody's going to go i'll evaluate that on the financial side or is, how does that work because i hear that very frequently yeah hayes that is a really good question you know right now getting access to the c suite you know for these types of questions these types of products that are coming up in the market is very challenging and so that's where organizations are going uh, more towards groups that meet like CEOs or CFOs or, or supply chain folks or in the pharma area, the pharma folks to really bring their offering up. Because as you said, it's considered a new technology, a new opportunity. And right now, the C-suites are really not taking too many calls from the outside. So they really want to associate with their peers And this is where information comes in, bubbles up, and then they start sharing about, I heard about this and I heard about that. We should give this, give this a shot. It's really important, I think, for a a company that has either a new product and just start out as a company or an established company that has a new product trying to bring it through as a new strategy. They really need to understand each organization that they're doing business with. I know that's a lot of work on their behalf, but they really have to understand their mission, vision, and values. Having that in their in their basket to pull out and say, your mission is to care for the community. Your 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 mission is to heal, you know, or to expand your reach. To understand that and to project that really is your intro to that C-suite, because if they hear that coming from an outside party, they're going to listen to the next five or 10 minutes and listen to what they have. When you talk about a generality, such as we can reduce your length of stay by a day or half day or a fraction of a day, or we can reduce your infection rate, okay, you really have to back that up with some really good data. Because Materials, directors, supply chain executives, CFOs, they get this on a regular basis from a lot of organizations. And, and you have to have the data behind that really shows you have actually done this or you're willing to be the test site. And this is what we'll do to step up and make it happen. And maybe we put our, our fees at risk or something at risk in order to get in your organization to make it happen. Sometimes that's a good offering as well. Back to Hayes, your, your question, you know, getting in front of groups of people, small groups of people to really socialize uh, really is a benefit for both the organization that's presenting and trying to get their product or service in the market, as well as for those that are listening to it. Mm-hmm. Good. Thanks. Jim, you, you brought up a, a really good point after you said Hayes had a good question. And, um, I think he said it was a tremendous I think he said good, question. not great. So we got to get to great before we can really get on the bus. So anyways, let me back can, this up. Can we roll this back? Great Let's is roll a book, this by the way. Good to great is a book, and that we can, we can talk to Quint, too, right? Uh, I love yeah, it, Jim. I love it. I think we need to roll this thing back to make sure we get that correct. We will. We will. Well, Jim, you brought up you know a really good point about understanding the organization. And really, I want to tap into your experience. One of the things is sometimes you have the mothership or you have the giant organization that's based, you know, back east or the Midwest, and it's got 120 hospitals or it's got 85 hospitals. And Jim, you're out in, you know, California or you're out in Washington State or wherever you're at. How do you balance? How do you balance the needs of what you have in your local area, following the mission, supporting your patients, and still answering to the metrics? of the mothership. How do you balance that? I think that's a difficult task in any situation where I've been. I've reported to the CFO and, and, and been with you, Jim, on this, but how do you balance that? Oh, boy. Well, that, that, that's a, you know incredibly astronomically fantastic question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you wanted the one up, so we, we had... I, had thank you, Jim. Time. Thank you. So, I, but Jim, but let um, me just say, I gave him that question. <laughs> so, so, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Well, if I, if I try to tie this across, I'm not sure I'm going to get to the, to your answer, Gary. I'll do my, my best. I'm, I think I'm understanding how you're coming across here, but, but really what we were talking about before about the mission, vision and values, understanding each organ, you need to understand it too, actually within a broader organization. So let's just take St. Joseph Health System, which is now part of province. And so you've got north and south and you've got east, you know, which made up the system. 
And they all have the same mission. They all have the same vision. They all have the same values, but they operate differently because they're in different geographical locations. And so you have various CFOs in those regions and they report in to the, to the, as you say, the health system CFO. And so what's really important here is, is connections. And, you know, this is where you get to the matrix organization, but it really is on the CFO within those geographical locations. If they're you know, over one hospital or a series of hospitals to really stay connected with the health system CFO on everything that's going on. And so they're always doing it both verbally. And I always advocate for like monthly reports and writing to what's going on. And as part of those communications, you're taking into consideration how you are viewing the revenue cycle, how you are viewing supply chain, but also how you are viewing strategy of that organization. What's going on in your C-suite that the health system CFO needs to, to understand. And if you have an entry again, by an organization that's trying to bring a new technology, you can actually be successful in that environment if you get into that CFO or that maybe maybe it's a supply chain executive for the area and say, can we test it here as opposed to trying to win the whole system? Can we test it here. There's a couple good examples of this. One I'll give you is actually ICU Medical, which I think you all know about. They've been around for a long time and they were actually manufactured. They never distributed stuff. They were manufactured. They sold to Baxter and Abbott and, you know, and a few others, but they're with their, you know, with their technology. And they came to us as St. Joseph and said, you know, we, we can do this without, you know, we can do this. We don't have to use Abbott or Baxter for this. I hope we don't get in trouble here, but it's a long, it was a long time ago, you know, beep, and, and so, beep. <laughs> and so, and so they go, we don't want to do your system. We just want to test it out at a hospital. So can, can we can we do that? Let's just test it out at one hospital, the tubing. Let's just do the tubing there, okay? And we'll give you this. This you know, the price is incredibly low, it was, and it's you know, same tubing. You know, it's the same tubing we distribute everywhere else. Can we try it out here? And so I go, yeah, let's give it. It makes sense. You know, good compelling argument. We'll try it at one hospital. It worked there, and so all of a sudden it went system wide. Sometimes being patient. And say we, we don't have to win the system. Let, let's, let's, let's get in here. Yeah. Let's just do a little, just do a little bit and see if we can expand it from there. The other thing that suppliers and, and, and those who provide services need to probably get more understanding of in, in current days versus even five years ago is that your, your sales cycle has expanded. So you don't just go in, you used to be go in, here's the product, you want to buy it? Yes, here you go. We start the, start the process. Well, you know, now it's, you have to kind of call on people multiple times, but you also have to call on multiple systems and, and, and hospitals and that. I'd say just, just do your presentation, move on. Do your presentation, move on. Get busy with doing the presentations. And one or two of those might actually fall at some point in time. You can always circle back, but don't, don't just get hunkered down with one or two you know, uh, opportunities, but really expand your opportunities, have several conversations. You know, Jim, one of the things that I've been talking to people about lately that I feel like has been coming up more and more. And to your point, you know, a lot of times people are like, if I get to the sea level, I'm with the decision maker, and then they're going to make this happen. And I think what you're talking about is that sales cycle slowed down because what I'm hearing now is you get to, you know, the sea level and they say, we'd love to do it. But because the organization's so big and because we talk about different concepts like servant leadership and just change management and the things that we've learned about that, nobody just brings the hammer down anymore and says, we're doing this. I mean, occasionally, yes. But by and part, in most scenarios, especially when you don't know a company that well and you don't have a lot of proof of concept behind it or you know, colleagues that are saying, yes, this is an easy one, you should do it, what's happening is, the C level is saying, okay, I will absolutely love to give this a try. Here are the 20 people you have to go talk to and get them to sign on, and then we'll be able to do it. Do you find that that is happening more and more, and that that's part of the picture that you're painting? Well, Justin, I sure hope it's not 20 people, but I think your your point is well taken, though, because there used to be a history where you, you see that I like that. That looks cool. I like the color of it. You know, it's, it's, it's going to go into your knee, but I like the color of the product. You know, let's use it. But, but hmm, you know, but the thing is, is that organizations need to be empowered. So all of your leaders, the C-suite needs to empower their 
if they have AB, an AVP level, the AVP, the director, the manager, if you're empowering an organization, you get a lot accomplished. And those who are working within that structure become engaged in the organization, they get engaged with the mission. So as an example, Justin, if you bring something to me and say, Jim, I have this new product and you already have a contract with us, but we'd like to kind of put this on contract as well. And this is what it's going to do for you. And this, is, this is the benefit. I will probably say, well, I've got this incredible, and I do actually, this incredible materials AVP right now, okay? I want you to put it in front of her, and I want her to be able to really take a look at this and respond back to me with what she thinks. Now, if I'm doing what I should as a CFO, I'm going to say this appears to be a good offering. I'm going to mark it down, and I'm going to speak to Andrea in a few days or after you have that conversation with her and say, what did you think? What, what are the pluses and minuses of that? And, and she'll give me back a straight answer because that's what she does. She's a straight talker. And from there, we make a conscious decision as to we've got enough information. This is a go. Or this has some clinical implications to it. We need to socialize this with the clinical team. And But under the same principle, we're doing this for a week, you know, and we're going to get the feedback and we're going to go. So if your structure is set up appropriately, that's how it really should work. What else? So I heard a lot about what suppliers can do better, you know, to help adopt new technology that could be transformative. Because we know today everybody's looking, they need a lot of help with the staffing crisis. I mean, I just think new tech, especially whether it's a clinical product or it's something that's automating processes that have been very manual in the past or that speed up the pace of play. Like we know that that adoption needs to be there, but traditionally healthcare has moved, you know, fairly slow in the last decade on this, because I think of some of the concepts that you're talking about just now is this empowerment piece. But we're also under really major constraints. So there's, you know, kind of two different opposing forces that are really putting a lot of pressure on healthcare organizations that way. And I, I heard what suppliers can do better. And I think you started to talk about what healthcare does, but you alluded to the way that they could do it in a matter of still being able to maintain a pace of play that allows them to be as proactive and innovative and forward thinking as possible. What else can healthcare organizations do better as supply chain leaders are listening to this conversation today? Sure. I'd like to go back to my example, Justin, of ICU medical, because I think this kind of highlights your point. I need to probably accent a little bit more because when they came in, I wasn't excited about doing this because they were offering like a hundred thousand dollars of savings and our supply chain spend was over half a you know to almost half a billion at the time okay so what's you know we got we got stuff on the on the docket here that's seven figures seven figures so all these opportunities that we have to go after that really require that we take our you know take the time and place our time in that so being able to put it in a prioritization that's really what hospitals and health systems need to do, get that priority set and then work that priority list. And something that's maybe down here at the bottom, if it doesn't require a lot of your effort, if your supplier that you have that you're associated with can actually spend their time and help work it through to where it's minimal time on your part to get a result to determine if this is going to be viable going forward, you want to invite that in and make it happen. So I think we as hospitals and health systems need to first listen clearly to what is being presented, because sometimes we tune off and we're, we're already at the next meeting that we're thinking about or thinking about what happened in the past. You know, we're not in the present. Be present. Listen to what's going on. If it makes sense, move it along, but also put it in a priority list to go forward and then eventually execute upon it. I think, you know, right now it's a little bit haphazard. I think we just like poke here and here and here. We need to make sure that we set plans and then work those plans in order to get <laughs> success. Which is how supply chain becomes strategic sourcing. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. So I can say then that that comment, Justin, was like an incredibly insightful comment. <laughs> well done, Justin. Well done. <laughs> Not just great questions. It's great insight. Insight is a new one. Right? New bar. New bar. <laughs> that, 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 that's how it works, right? Check, check is in the mail. <laughs> All right, Jim, for perspective, you're talking about, you know, the meetings and things. I, I would be curious because I did a time and kind of a meeting survey years ago with their CEOs and supply chain. On a given week, you as a CFO, how many meetings do you are you attending? 
Oh Just, well, what does that look like? And also maybe what does it look like from the perspective of talking about, you know, who you're meeting with? A fi- what fin- is it banks? Is it I mean, bond holders? All, what does that look like? Yeah. I'll give you the overview, then I'll dive down like, like an eagle should, I guess, right? But well, exactly. the eagle and maybe the crow, because the crow likes to eat stuff. Like, I don't know. Anyway, so anyway, <laughs> first from the, from the eagle perspective, if you go back prior to 2020, we're talking maybe a maximum of eight to 10 meetings a day, okay? Because most meetings would go an hour. You'd have everybody present, and you would talk about, whatever subject matter you would have, and then you would do the next steps and move on. Well, now the meetings can be up as 16 to 20 a day because you are in a virtual environment. A lot of these meetings are now cut down to half hours, some of even 15 minutes. And so you're like moving back and forth. And I think that has caused a lot of anxiety with many executives and maybe has led to some of our turnover that we're actually seeing today. I mean, there were a couple of different Becker's articles, as an example, that, that showed that we got a lot of, you know, CFO turnover, CEO turnover, executive ranks, you know, shifting, all of that stuff. But from a CFO perspective, my time is spent, I spend maybe, maybe half to 60% of my time now in meetings. And I do this consciously because I want time to be able to think and put stuff down in writing and get it out to people for strategy. I do the meetings with our, our CEO, our COO, our executive team meets weekly. I do several outside calls. I like to have a couple outside calls with peers, peer CFOs during the week to see what they're doing to kind of decide what are you doing that I can pick up on? This is what I'm doing that you should consider doing. So I do that at as well. And then each, each week I have a huddle Monday morning to meet with all of my direct reports as to how we're going to go through the week, find out what they're doing, what they need for me as far as help, and how they connect amongst each other to ensure that they're going to be successful for that week. And then I do individual meetings with them throughout the week to make sure they get what they need there. You talked about, I think, Gary, you're the one that talked about servant leadership, I believe, uh, if I recall that right. Maybe it was Justin. It might have been Hayes, you know. Anyway, maybe all three of you. But if you're if you're a good servant leader, you're, you're you're holding the position for the purpose of making sure that other people are successful. So the time you have, you should be investing in those people for what they do. So as an example, you know, I have a supply chain background and I do not want to get at Andrea and be in her back pocket all the time and micromanage her because she's the expert. But I do want to make her successful. So whatever she needs from me, I want to make sure I give her. The same thing to our revenue cycle team, the same thing to our finance team. So that's very important to really make sure it happens. Hey, hey Jim, just a quick add-on question to this. Is is rounding taking place back in the hospitals? Is rounding a piece of the puzzle? I mean, during the pandemic and during COVID, I think that stopped a lot. But are we back going to a floor and running into the VP of nursing or the director of supply chain? Are we rounding again? Is that happening? We are. And it's so important right now because of the you know, all the discussion on burnout, you know, the anxiety that's out there. It's really good for people to see leadership, even leadership that's not in the area come in and really have a conversation. And it doesn't have to be a conversation about, you know, work, how you doing, what's going on with the family, that type of thing. That's kind of important too, to make that, that make that connection. So yes, uh, Gary, rounding is back, but also it's interesting. There is also a lot of virtual <laughs> rounding going on too. Because so many people are off-site in other locations or possibly working from home. So there is virtual rounding. They call it rounding. Really, I, I consider it a one-on-one connect. But yeah, rounding is back. Probably not to the level it was before the pandemic, but it is back. But put in perspective, your numbers you just gave me, Jim, the survey I did years ago, the, the average CEO spent 1,200 meetings, attended 1,200 meetings a year. You would actually be higher than that if you, if you start thinking about it it, it adds up and so it's yeah, 1200 to- a year is 100 a month so you know the numbers that we just got from jim it's like triple or quadruple that yeah so well and then you well we i think we factored in like you know i've got how many you know weeks of vacation and all those things they typically got about thirty five thousand emails a year and they spent roughly uh, over 600 hours a year just replying to email and so yeah it's a it's a tough I mean, you know, then they expect you as a company maybe to meet with them or whatever it is. There's just so many hours of the day. What about the doing? If we're in meetings, right, this is the classic complaint 
from people who look at their calendar and see it loaded up with the meetings. They're like, I have strategic objectives, you know, or goals for my position. And I'm in meetings all the time. I don't have any time to do my actual job. Is there a way <laughs> to kind of balance that so that, and maybe, maybe I'm just assuming with all the meetings you're taking that this is a, this may be a strategy you've had to develop as that's increased for you, especially as you mentioned, it's happening to all of us. More Zoom meetings, less travel in between meetings, which means less downtime. I mean, there are people who complain, I don't even get a chance to take a bathroom break because I just stack them on top of each other. So how do we make sure that the doing happens? And even as we talk about the adoption of new technology, I feel like this question is also tied in with why things tend to move slower because you also hit on mindfulness. When you're in a meeting, there's no point in being there if you're not going to be mindful with your presence, right? Right. Well, Justin, a couple of good points. Well, actually, you know, meetings used to be an hour, and then you go right to the next hour, right to the next hour. So the first thing I did was cut it down to 45 minutes. And so I had 15 minutes to prepare, but you can also use that 15 minutes to go to the bathroom. But I don't use 15 minutes for that. I can do, you know, anyway. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, but, but it, it, you, you can, you can kind of, uh, come off the, the meeting that you've had, take your notes, maybe put out a couple emails that you need to, and then get into your next meeting. So that, that's one way that folks have really improved their calendar. But really what's happened, Justin, and I can actually do it right now. And you guys would not like it one bit because it would not be good for your viewership. And your viewership would go right through the floor. But I can, I could do this podcast while I'm doing emails. I can be over here doing emails or I can be looking at my phone and checking other stuff here. The multitasking environment has exponentially gone up. And actually many people can be somewhat successful at that doing two things at once. What we lose in that is the presence that we talked about before where we're really listening to what's going on. We may catch half of it or three quarters of it. But maybe it's not going to be make us available to really be part a meaningful part of the conversation. And so many folks are now multitasking to make this happen. So you talk about emails. When can we do the emails? Well, I don't necessarily want to do them at nine or 10 o'clock tonight. So I will do it now while I'm in this meeting over here. That's what people are doing. I tend to do some of my emails at night. And what I do is, and I think this is a I like this as a good practice. I don't call it a best practice because there's other people have better practices than I do. But I think it's a good practice that when I'm doing emails at night, I'm sending stuff out. I actually intentionally delay the email to go out until 6.30 a.m. the next morning. So that way, if someone gets it at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, they don't feel compelled that they have to respond because then I'm calling them back to work. you know, And that's just not right. That's just not appropriate. But it happens a lot and it brings anxiety back to the, the folks that are, that are, you know, in the business. So I don't think, Justin, we've actually necessarily solved it. I think we need a few other solutions to really do what's best with our time going forward. We need some better solutions. You know, and wrap all this up as a CFO, but also it goes right back to the VP of supply chain or VP of whatever. They have the same challenges of time that, that you're talking about. It's everybody in the system, right? I mean, everybody's jammed with all this stuff. So I think COVID did speed things up to your point earlier. And so I don't know that it's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, but it's well, definitely, it's it's definitely sped, faster. It's sped up our lives, but, but to the central point of this whole interview, it didn't necessarily speed up you know, how we've advanced or changed or adapted, right? I mean, like, here's a great example. One of the biggest challenges was back orders, right? So that didn't speed up the delivery of care, but that definitely, like, put a lot of work on everybody and sped up their daily lives because instead of dealing with one or two back orders, they're now dealing with hundreds of back orders and they're bouncing between, can we get an alternative you know, supply in here. Can we do this or can we do that? So their lives sped up, but I'm not sure that the care that was delivered to the patient or our ability to innovate and really start looking creatively and strategically changed, which comes back to the adoption of new technology. Like I think Jim, you said it best. We're in a position where we we're kind of like figuring this out, but we really need something transformative with even time management because we've log jammed with all these additional tasks. And it's not necessarily delivering better care for the patient, even though we're doing more. 
Absolutely right. I think both your comment, Justin and, and Hayes are, are right on. You know, during the pandemic, it was all about just get the stuff in. Pricing wasn't as much of a concern because the, you know, the number one, you know, the mission is to care for the patient. And we had patients. Some, some organizations were overloaded with patients. You had to care for the patient. And as we peel back from the pandemic, it, it's difficult to get back to where you were and to, to re, re-enter healthcare as you were three years ago, where discussions were being held about how we transform, how we provide better care, how we provide care in alternate settings. So those discussions are happening today, but they were probably going much quicker back prior to 2020. So we've had this this pause, and now we have to kind of re-energize ourselves and get back in those discussions again. And and I feel like the suppliers, maybe part of that strategy is augmenting. You had mentioned before, you know, if it's like this lower, you know, it's not on the top priority. It's not the biggest number in terms of revenue or savings, but it's a really good idea. We just can't commit our time to it. Do you feel like the strategy for suppliers really needs to bring more value into the equation? And something that you and I talked about as we were sort of discussing this conversation was you really emphasized training to me as something that suppliers could really do that would differentiate them today. Yes. We used to call it, I think, in supply land sales, you know, we we really need to call it more of a service oriented function to where you're providing either a service or supplies or both. But how are those supplies used? How, how are they used most effectively? And we need to train folks on how, how we do this. And we even train those that are bringing the supplies in, the, the supply chain team. You know, how do you handle this? How do you move it through the organization? What's the most effective use? Because we don't want to just sell and something sits on a shelf and then two years later it's expired or it gets obsolete. We want to make sure those products, those services have an impact. I mean, that should be the mission. That is the mission of the suppliers is we produce products that improve the care of the patient, that heal the patient. So you want to take a look back at what you've done and tell the organization, we provided you this much. This is where you provide the products to the patients. This has been a success. What else can we do for you? And, and so that, that training is kind of important. And that interchange is, is kind of important as well. There's been a lot of talk across the United States and, and you know globally for that matter is 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 capital and and capital right now we used to be able to like put it on a list and six to nine months we get it and I see and I'm hearing a lot of the break fix category is where we're at right now and it makes me nervous. I want to hear your perspective. If we stay so long in a break fix mentality and it's, you know, we're nine months before this new stuff can come in, we're 12 months and we keep reprioritizing and reprioritizing because we're still in the red, we're still not financially feasible. Is, is that a, a bad way to go? Is, is it a concerning to you? I just want to get your perspective from a capital perspective, taking care of our patients down the road on that. Yeah, I am extremely worried about this, Gary. And you are correct. We're, we are in a break fix mode. My estimation or, or, or guess, I'll never say guess probably. Like, like I guess, like I said, I guess UCLA is going to win over <laughs> Gonzaga. <laughs> Something like that. But my, my, my idea here is that we were probably in this break fix picture or the window for about two years. And the reason for that is because the cash flow situation of many organizations is negative. And there's a concern about the performance of the investment portfolio and if and when that's going to come back. Well, it's not an if, it's when it's going to come back, but is it going to be one year, two years, three years? And they can always dip into some of that for capital if they need it, or they can go out and finance. Whoops, wait a second. The rates are pretty high, you know, and then you got this thing called MADS, M-A-D-S, which can make you MADS, but it stands for maximum allowable debt service. And you have to have the cash flow at the end of each year to say that you are meeting your MADS metric with those who have issued bonds to the to the bondholders, a trustee and the like. And a lot of organizations had that difficulty in 2022. So everybody's looking at an easy way to preserve cash. And one of the easiest ways is we just pause on capital. 
And so we've gone from a capital planning scenario of 12 months, which to me is still very short. It should be like five years to you got capital to say, you know, your hospital has capital of five million and you will spend it when we say you can spend it. And you have to produce something that really absolutely needs to be replaced now. And so that's kind of where we are. And we will be that way, I think, for two years, Gary, until we have more organizations that head back into the cash flow positive area and healthy cash flow to where they can start really putting dollars out there for either expanding their system or, you know, replacing facilities or renovating facilities or buying that new piece of equipment that's going to do much more on behalf of the patient. Man, I could not agree more on moving from a twelve to a, a twelve month to a five year because how many times do those middle of the ground capital, you know, needs just keep getting kicked down and nobody even sees it because there isn't a five year plan, there's a one year plan. And when you get through to that end of that year, something else becomes a priority again. And the next thing you know, you are in break fix land with all those middle of the ground, you know, capital pieces of equipment. So Jim, this was a, a phenomenal interview. And, and you know, I think you gave us a multi level kind of understanding of not only today's environment, but how to be successful. And, and you know, as everybody likes to say, this is kind of a cliche in healthcare now, but from both sides of the table and the perspective, because the partnership is so important. So I appreciate you sharing your insights today and and the compliments that you gave all of us for our <laughs> questions and, and insights today. Well, I, I do appreciate your time. And I think what you actually do, and this is a sincere compliment, the other ones were too, but this is a sincere compliment <laughs> that, you know, what you do here is also important because you're, you're spreading the word. You're getting uh, several different views from either CEOs, COOs, you know, CFOs, uh, VPs of various areas of supply chain to really express how, what they believe. And you, you, you get common trends, which are important for people to hear. So getting the word out, which is what you're doing, is is very important and it, and it's uh, it, it's very meaningful. So please, you know, don't don't stop doing it. You know, keep putting on those headphones and uh, you know make make it happen. If you only knew how much we made doing this, you know we would never stop. <laughs> <laughs> Just as cut checks every day. Yeah. In that, in that case, I, I in that case I should probably come on boarding and buy myself some headphones. That's so, right. That's uh, right, yeah. Jim. And, 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 we and would get, like, and get like you know a deer behind me with with antlers or something to exactly. That's yeah. right. Some redneck. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you've been, it's great. been great. I appreciate Jim. Jim. Yeah. yeah. I, so we could probably bring you back for a lot of different nuanced conversations at some point. So we might have to reach out to you again because you'd be really good at multiple things. So oh, yeah. Well done. Love it. Well, thank you. I appreciate you all and what you do. So uh, no, it's awesome. you're a good friend. Thank I you for your time. You. The Sisters of yeah, Crondelet you, would be proud. The Sisters of Crondelet would be proud. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yep. Go Vols. <laughs> That was Jim McManus, principal at JPM3 Financial and Advisory Services, and just a phenomenal conversation, Hayes. And one of the things that really sticks out to me, not only the conversation and empowering leaders within the organization, even at the C-level, but, but also just kind of explaining the best way to approach hospitals, even from a supplier's side and perspective, is, is understanding their mission their values, all of that, I think, was really incredibly important because we were talking about how many emails they get and the stacked meetings, and people are always like, how come I can't get anybody's attention? Well, <laughs> there's just not a lot of time in prioritizing the things that are going to generate revenue or create savings within an organization that are high dollar. At that point, you know, it's pretty easy. You just kind of line them up and you work your way through. But I thought it was really insightful that Jim said on some of those lower opportunities for an organization to save or generate revenue, if there isn't going to be a lot of work required for the supply chain team, then in that case, you know, getting more partnerships from the vendors, you still got to move those ones through too to just have those add up over time and contribute to what currently, and Hayes, you probably know this better than anybody, are some pretty astronomical targets for bottom line improvement for healthcare. 
Yeah, it's almost uh, it's crazy to think that some of the targets that they've been asked to hit on supply chain is absolutely ridiculous. It's uh, you know year over year they're they're supposed to take out tens of millions of dollars in some cases. So it's really really difficult. And back to what you said earlier, the the speed and the velocity of meetings and time and information and emails it's nonstop so it's a very very difficult time for for everybody in this uh, business but uh, supply chain's got a tough one and it was really interesting because Jim's past he has been a supply chain executive at a big system he has been a CFO at two different systems so he has great insight and I really enjoyed it he did a good job yeah fantastic communicator for sure that's going to do it for this episode. The best way to listen to our podcast is by downloading the smartphone app for iPhone and Android. We've got all kinds of categories of content, articles on the go, if you're not already listening to those. But if you are listening to podcasts on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts, certainly you'll find us there. Just search for the Power Supply Podcast. We're also on iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify. Really, you can find us anywhere. We love feedback. So we want you to comment on the social media posts. Definitely follow us on LinkedIn, connect with us. You can even send us a, an instant message. Let us know what you think about the podcast or if you'd like to come on it. But more importantly, beyond likes, we'd love to see comments on the episode post. So if you learned something from Jim today that was really helpful, go find the post on LinkedIn, make a comment and engage with us there. If you do want to keep your comments private, you can send us an email to info at powersupply media.net as well and on behalf of Hayes Gary and myself thanks for listening to this week's episode of Power Supply Power Supply